Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Those words describe a vision of the West and a show, both of which were of epic proportions. The Wild West was something which William F. Buffalo Bill Cody experienced and then promoted. Buffalo Bill's vision and version of the Wild West was shared with millions of people during his lifetime and really endures until today. William F. Buffalo Bill Cody was a child of the West. By the time he reached age 25, he'd experienced just about everything that a young man could, about every adventure a young man could experience in the West. Let's see. There we go, and there he is as a young man. Born in 1846 in Iowa, he moved with his family to Leavenworth, Kansas at about age eight, about the time this photo was taken. There the family became involved in the abolitionist cause. His father actually was against bringing slavery into Kansas, went up at a, a public meeting and spoke out against slavery being brought into Kansas, and at that point a man from Missouri stepped up on the the, the platform and stabbed him, nearly killing him because of, of what he was saying. And uh, the family would continue to be sort of pestered by the pro-slavers uh, until finally, or whatever, I guess finally is not the right word, but until his father died three years later of a fever, which really, uh, because of his weakened condition after that earlier stabbing. So Buffalo Bill, in my mind, had some pretty good grounding as a young boy. So after his father died, 11-year-old Will went to work as a messenger boy and herding cattle. Then later that year, he uh, took a job as a driver on a wagon train, making the first of many Great Plains crossings. Imagine this. Imagine the 11-year-olds in your life going across the Great Plains from Kansas to Salt Lake. They are helping out as a wagon driver, and they're out there with all the you know, the kinds of things that could happen to people out uh, crossing the plains. So he, he had a pretty good start with that, but that wasn't just it. He had other adventures as well. Now, while he was on this trip, he met this fellow. Who is that? Hickok. Wild Bill Hickok. And that, he and Wild Bill Hickok became lifelong friends. After that, he went on to do some fur trapping. And then gold mining. In fact, his uh, effort to do gold mining brought him to the uh, Central City area uh, as one of those Pikes Peak gold rushers in 1859. And he, like so many of them, didn't find a bit of gold. Ended up heading back to Kansas. On his way back there, he was hired by the Pony Express. And so he rode with the Pony Express for a brief, brief time. Then during the Civil War, he served with the 7th Kansas Cavalry. And then after the war, he scouted for the Army. He gained the nickname Buffalo Bill while he was working for the Kansas Pacific Railroad. And also he hunted for the Army too. And he got this name Buffalo Bill. Here's a poem of the day. Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill, never missed and never will. Always aims and shoots, shoots to kill. And the company pays his Buffalo Bill. <laughs> Interestingly enough, for those of you that might be literature fans, James Joyce in Ulysses makes reference to this particular poem, one of his characters. Buffalo Bill's legend grew as newspapers and dime novels carried stories of his exploits. Uh, many of the stories only vaguely, if at all, uh, resembled any real occurrences in his life. But by the time he was 25, Buffalo Bill was a celebrity. His show business career began on December 17, 1872 in Chicago. He was age 26. The Scouts of the Prairie, let's see if I can figure out how to use this. There we go. Scouts of the Prairie was a drama created by dime novelist Ned Buntline, who appeared in it, in it with Cody and with another well-known um, scout named Texas Jack Omahundro. And Texas Jack, incidentally, died of pneumonia later on in uh, Leadville and is buried up in the Lead, one of the Leadville cemeteries. Joining them on stage, so here you see them identified, Ned, Buffalo Bill, and Texas Jack. Joining them on stage was Mademoiselle Morlocky, who is credited with introducing the can-can to America. So this was a stellar crew here. Now, the show was a success, although one critic characterized Cody as a good-looking fellow, 
tall and straight as an arrow, but ridiculous as an actor. <laughs> but some of the other critics noticed that he was very good at charming the audiences and keeping their attention. And um, that is what really he was about. He wasn't an actor, he was a showman. Well, after a year of traveling with Ned Buntline, Texas Jack and Buffalo Bill discovered that Ned Buntline had, they'd done very well, but he pocketed most of the proceeds. And he took most of the profits and they didn't get paid very well. So they split off and the next year organized the Buffalo Bill combination. And they had a show so creatively named Scouts of the Plains. You notice the difference? The other was Scouts of the Prairies. This is Scouts of the Plains. That included Buffalo Bill, Texas Jack, and yes, that old friend, Wild Bill Hickok. So eventually, Wild Bill and Texas Jack left the show. But Cody continued staging a variety of plays for the next decade. He appeared all over the United States. In fact, his combination appeared in Denver uh, in July 21, 23, and at Central City Opera on July 30 in 1879. And then again in Central Sea on April 2 and April 5th through 10th in 1886. So he got as far as that. He did not, however, get up to Summit County. So um, folks here missed out on that. Maybe some of them went down to see him in Central City. In 1882, Cody had an idea. Immense success and comparative wealth attained in the profession of showman stimulated me to greater exertion and largely increased my ambition for public favor. Accordingly, I conceived the idea of organizing a large company of Indians, cowboys, Mexican vaqueros, famous writers, and expert lasso throwers with accessories of stagecoach, emigrant wagons, bucking horses, and a herd of buffalo with which to give a realistic entertainment of wildlife on the plains. Well, Cody's idea was a real hit. The nation was eager to see live and in person the West they'd been reading about in the newspapers and in the dime novels. With Cody as a headliner and visionary, Nate Salisbury was the manager, and then another gentleman named John Burke, who uh, actually was a marketing genius and has laid the groundwork for a lot of marketing today. We were talking about marketing earlier. Uh, John Burke was the publicist and marketer for the show. They created this extravaganza that has had an indelible imprint upon history and upon show business history. To promote the show, Buffalo Bill hired some of the best lithographers of the day, uh, created high quality advertising posters. This incidentally is one of the first casts from 18, it says 1883, it's 1884, Philadelphia. That picture's taken and it includes a mountain man here, John Wayne Nelson, there's Buffalo Bill. Here's a scout, uh, dang, his name just escaped me. Of course, Indians. African Americans, it was already, and then the Carols, it was already a, the first show and it only became more so over the years. So Buffalo Bill's Wild West traveled around the U.S., not only showing off uh, all those people we saw, but of course central to the Wild West were the Indians. And here you see them attacking the Deadwood stage. Buffalo Bill's Wild West, through its posters, but through its activities and what it promoted, promoted more than just itself. The Wild West used real cowboys and cowgirls. They were recruited from ranches in the West. Now, our modern image of the American cowboy, of the Old West cowboy, is due largely to Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Uh, because when first Buffalo Bill started touring, if you called somebody a cowboy, it was an insult. Nobody wanted to be a cowboy. They were considered rude, rough, coarse, and not the sort of person you want to spend any time around. So Buffalo Bill, though, promoted the cowboy's abilities, the bronco riding, the roping, and the other skills. And over time, that helped sort of elevate the cowboy to the kind of position that people regard them with today. And in fact, his uh, cowboy fun component of the show uh, was a forerunner of modern professional rodeo. Oh, here. Time for a brief and shameless announcement. Um, 
I wrote this book because I felt that many people did not realize these influence that Buffalo Bill has had on American culture. He really was a visionary, hence I called the book Scout, Showman, Visionary. Um, I want to also let people know about the many marvelous artifacts that we have in the museum. It is lavishly, lavishly illustrated with 200 images of artifacts associated with his life, many of them from the museum, uh, guns, saddles, outfits, posters, the whole schmear. Um, so uh, I will be, after this, selling those for $20 even. I can only accept cash or a check. I do not have one of those things for plastic, yeah, one of them things. And I, I don't have that. Uh, but I will accept cash. Now, it's $20. Usually, it's $24.95 plus tax. So I'm giving you a little bit of a discount. And I will sign it for you. Now, if you want it unsigned, it'll cost you $24.95. <laughs> so Buffalo Bill was an advocate for the Indians. He had encountered them warrior to warrior during the Indian Wars, and he shared a mutual respect with them. Buffalo Bill indeed endorsed westward expansion, but he felt the Indians, while they had to make way for that expansion and civilization, still needed to be respected. Their culture needed to be respected, and he advocated for their equal rights. He had a great sympathy for them. He wrote, the defeat of Custer was not a massacre. The Indians were being pursued by skilled fighters with orders to kill. For centuries, they had been hounded from the Atlantic to the Pacific and back again. They had their wives and little ones to protect, and they were fighting for their existence. So after the Indian Wars, he became sort of one of the greatest allies that the Lakota Nation in particular had. He referred to them as there, the Americans. They were here first. They deserve to be called the original Americans. Sitting Bull uh, toured with the Wild West during the 1885 season and became friends with Cody. And actually, Sitting Bull's headdress, it looks very much like this one, is in uh, the Buffalo Bill Museum on Lookout Mountain. And there's a photograph in this book that I, I think I mentioned. <laughs> anyway. Oh, now here. This is not an infomercial, okay, guys? Uh, my other book. My latest book deals with Lakotas who perform in Wild West shows, uh, particularly in Europe. It begins with Buffalo Bill's Wild West in 1887, going to London, and continues through the eve of World War II in 1935. And one of the things I've tried to do in this book is show how participation in the Wild West shows helped the Lakota preserve their culture and also influence European understandings of the American West. And indeed, the, the protection of the culture, I think, is something that people haven't realized. But at the time, uh, they were trying to practice cultural genocide against the Lakota. It was not a literal genocide. They're not killing them all off. But they were trying to essentially kill the savage, save the man, by turning them into replicas of white folks and get rid of their culture. And be, by able, being able to perform in the shows, the Lakotas were able to maintain aspects of their culture and promote it. And it was particularly important when it was promoted in Europe, not only because it helped understanding in Europe about the Lakota's plight and who, who they were and what their culture was, but because they were received in a much more honorable way by the people of Europe than they were in the United States. So that's enough. Now that one it has 300 color photos in it. So I'm up in the ante from the last one. Uh, it also is hardbound. Now it's a little more expensive because of that. It sells for $40, no, no tax, or tax included, I should say, $40, so it's a little pricey. But when you think about it, it's four pounds, which averages out to only $10 a pound. So that's kind of like a good steak. So there you go. Okay, so no more infomercials, I think. Anyway, something should be said about Buffalo Bill and his attitude towards women. It was very progressive for his time. Annie Oakley, who performed with the show from 1885 until 1901, adored Buffalo Bill and considered him a perfect gentleman. She did disagree with him on one point. She did not think women should get to vote, and Buffalo Bill strongly endorsed women <laughs> voting. Interestingly enough, although she could do anything most men could do anyway, but she just didn't want to do the voting. Um, 
Buffalo Bill not only favored women's suffrage, but he was, for example, a friend of, oh God, Susan B. Anthony. I, see, this is why retirement, I've got to, <laughs> anyway, I get these little lapses now and then. So Susan B. Anthony, in fact, uh, Susan B. Anthony, when the show was in Chicago in 1893, she praised Buffalo Bill's Wild West because it was open on Sundays and the Chicago World Exposition right across the street wasn't. And Susan B. Anthony said, because uh, they just felt it was wrong to be open on Sundays and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for the children. And she says, I just as soon have my young man go to see my son, go to see Buffalo Bill's Wild West as go to church. He'll learn as much there. <laughs> and so Buffalo Bill was pleased and he gave her free tickets. And uh, she's sitting in the audience and he takes his horse, rides up to her and gives her a deep bow and pays tribute to her. So uh, Cody though not only favored women's suffrage, he spoke on behalf of women's equal employment opportunity. In an 1898 interview he stated, if a woman can do the same work that a man can do and do it just as well, she should have the same pay. 1898. There's guys still don't have that figured out. So I always get a nice applause from the women on that one. But anyway, this is a photo of Lulu Parr. She was a champion women's bronco rider and performer in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Now, how many of you have been to the rodeo? Have you enjoyed the women bronco riding? <laughs> what happened was they were better than the men. And in the 1920s, a couple of women got died. Now, men have been dying all along from, from being bucked by horses and stuff. A couple of women died and the rodeo association decided they would not women let women participate in bronco riding anymore. So, but I think it was because they were better. So, um, and I'm sure Annie Oakley would agree with that. But at any rate, um, uh, uh, go out there and tell your local rodeo, hey, get the women bronco riding in there. It's got to be fun. It's got to be great. Okay. Well, Buffalo Bill's support of women's rights really was also rather insidious. Imagine, here are these women coming into town, these cowgirls, and they're riding. Annie Oakley is shooting it better than most men. They're riding and doing all these stunts, and they're sitting with their legs on both sides of the saddle and everything. So I'm thinking that when the women in these Victorian outfits that were rather tight, sitting there, expected to work on their needlepoint, not that there's anything wrong with needlepoint, but they're doing needlepoint in the parlor and they're told that's your place, they're thinking, no it ain't. <laughs> Buffalo Bill also promoted the skills of various ethnic groups in the West. Rope tricks and riding by Mexican vaqueros were a feature of the Wild West from the beginning. People of the time who knew the West, like Frederick Remington, Theodore Roosevelt, and Mark Twain praised the show for its accuracy. Mark Twain wrote to Buffalo Bill, I have now seen your Wild West show two days in succession, enjoyed it thoroughly. It brought back to me the breezy wildlife of the Rocky Mountains and stirred me like a war song. The song, the show is genuine. Cowboys, vaqueros, Indians, stagecoach costumes, the same as I saw on the frontier years ago. Well, Mark Twain was not the only person who was impressed by Buffalo Bill's Wild West. A young Winston Churchill pestered his mother until she finally took him to see the show. Joseph Campbell, if you recall, Joseph Campbell, Bill Moyers did a stuff on myth and Joseph Campbell's uh, work in the, area, in the area of myth. His interest in myth, Joseph Campbell's, not Bill Moyers, Joseph Campbell's interest in myth was prompted by seeing the Indians performing in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Gilbert and Sullivan considered doing an operetta about the Wild West. They didn't get to it, but uh, Puccini, Giacomo Puccini did an opera called Girl of the Golden West, which was actually in Denver last fall at the opera there, and that was provoked, if you will, or stimulated by his visit to Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Bram Stoker, what did Bram Stoker do? Dracula. Dracula! Well, the Texan Quincy Morris in the Dracula book, in his novel, was based in part on Buffalo Bill. Um, who else? Okay, um, New World Symphony, Antony Dvorak. Antony Dvorak 
was uh, went to see Buffalo Bill's Wild West that had helped sort of him with the creative process of writing New World Symphony. I mean, you get into all sorts of culture. Um, uh, uh, Gauguin, Paul Gauguin went to see the show. He was so impressed, he went twice, and he bought a Stetson hat. And I have found a painting that he did later on Tahiti where he's wearing his Stetson, a self-portrait. <laughs> and then finally, Thomas Edison, who was a friend of Buffalo Bill's, used his newly invented motion picture, ca picture camera to do footage of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, some of which still remains, and when you come visit the museum, you'll see some of that in our exhibits. Well, I've been kind of bouncing around period-wise in terms of the timeline, but Buffalo Bill's Wild West was catapulted into worldwide prominence in 1887 when it went to be the main American contribution to the Jubilee for Queen Victoria. It was the hit of London, of the whole celebration. The commoners, the nobility, and Queen Victoria herself visited it. Uh, it was even credited with improving British and American relations. Um, 1887, 1886, 88, I'm sorry, they came back to the United States. 1889, they went back to Paris, and that's where Gauguin saw the show. And, um, oh, you know who else saw the show? Edward Munch. I don't know if it made him scream or not. Ah! So, anyway. So, it continued touring Europe until 1893. And it was expanded and renamed Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Congress of Rough Riders of the World. The Rough Riders included English Lancers, Russian Cossacks, Argentine Gauchos, and horsemen and horsewomen from all over the world. And Buffalo Bill, yes, was the first to use the term Rough Riders. Teddy Roosevelt borrowed that. Riding side by side with all these people from the round world were cowboys and 100 Lakota warriors. By this time, the show had grown, including the support service, uh, support personnel and all, to a total of 640 people. Transporting around the, across the ocean, around Europe and around the United States by train. 1893, after several seasons, the seasons I just mentioned, traveling across Europe, Buffalo Bill comes to that World Columbian Exposition. He wants to go right in the Midway. The Midway's over here where the Ferris wheel is. But this gets back to one of the things I explore in the book of Lakota Performers. The, the, the people that ran the exposition decided it would not be appropriate to encourage the savages to be performing in their barbaric manners and show their, you know, their terrible culture and clothing and all of that. They said that would be totally inappropriate. So Buffalo Bill bought land right opposite the entrance to the show, to <laughs> World Columbian Exposition, and you can see it right here. And uh, so if you got off the uh, railroad in 1893, you could go right and you go into World Climbing Exposition, you go left and you go into World, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And almost as many people went to the Wild West as went to the exposition. And Buffalo Bill left Chicago with millions of people having seen the show and he himself had become a millionaire. Is that Chicago? Yeah. Chicago. Yeah, no, World Climbing Exposition in Chicago. Let's see, I went off script for a minute. Uh, okay, so the show continued after 1893 to uh, tour America for an, uh, nearly 10 years and then returned to Europe again. And during that year, um, they uh, played at the Champ de Mars, right in front of the Eiffel Tower. And about a year and a half ago, I got a wonderful picture off of eBay, of all places, of Buffalo Bill's Wild West performing. You could see the guys in the arena and in the background. Background is the Eiffel Tower. So it's kind of fun. So after that European tour, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West came back. Uh, and it traveled the United States as well. Now, to give you a bit of an idea of how much ground they covered, during the 1896 season, the show traveled 10,000 miles, 132 stops. The show season lasted from April through October. And um, so that was, it was a pretty rigorous uh, kind of workout. What happens, though, is by 1900, by the time they really come back from Europe uh, in 1906, the American tastes have started to change. They've seen almost 30 years of Wild West shows. There are now 
professional rodeos. There is motion pictures are starting to come up and show Wild West uh, kinds of shows. I mean, that's uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West helped promote the idea of doing the Westerns in movies. Uh, that helped lay the groundwork for that. So there was a lot of competition. So Buffalo Bill decides to combine his show with one of the guys that was probably the only real competition for him in the Wild West business, a guy named Pawnee Bill. And Pawnee Bill actually started out as an employee with Buffalo Bill and then went on and did his own show. So they now change it to Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Pawnee Bill's Far East. And you'll notice we've got everybody here. We've got Arabian acrobats, Bedouin riders. We have folks from the Sudan. We have uh, people from all over. Uh, we have one cast photo. You even see an aborigine holding his, his boomerang. He was showing how to do a boomerang. And there were, at that point, uh, there were people from every continent performing in Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Pawnee Bill's Far East, except for Antarctica. Uh, the, the penguins were really difficult to work with. So. Well, the combination, while profitable, didn't bring in the desired income. At age 63, Buffalo Bill decided he was getting tired of show business, and he and Pawnee Bill came up with this idea of a three-year farewell tour, which would cover the United States. Well, after the first three years, they discovered that uh, they still hadn't brought enough money, so they just quietly continued touring. Anyway, the farewell is over. I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> So it's kind of like when you get relatives coming to visit. But anyway, uh, so, sorry, I don't know where that came from. Um, anyway, he had this plan, though, for retiring eventually. And one of the other problems was he ran afoul of a guy in Denver. He borrowed some money from a guy named Harry Tammon, Denver businessman, co-owner of the, buff, of the uh, Denver Post. And uh, this is in 1913. Uh, they borrowed some money, and Buffalo Bill, with all of his other attributes, was not a real good businessman, and he signed the note that it would be paid off between April and June. Comes the end of June, he doesn't have enough money to pay Pawnee Bill back yet. Now, this had, not, this had happened before, and the other folks were just, okay, well, we know you're good for it. Your show is very popular. We'll get, we'll get the money. We know. That was, had not been Harry Tammon's plan at all. <laughs> Harry Tammon's plan had been to forced Buffalo Bill's Wild West to close and to make Buffalo Bill appear in his sales photo circus, which is what happened in 1913. Uh, Buffalo Bill, two weeks late on the note, and he uh, makes an appearance in uh, Denver with the show, and uh, Tammon has the show seized by, seized by the sheriff. And the entire show is sold off in August at Overland Park in Denver, and that is the end of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. So then he's forced to join Tammon's show for about two years, appearing with the circus, rides on, pretty much he's just there for the celebrity of it, and it's just a regular circus. And he tried to get out. Finally, in 1916, he pays Tammon $8,000 so he can continue using his own name, and he appears with 101 Ranch Wild West. He still attracted the crowds, but he was 70 years old. 70 years old. And uh, often at the end of the show, he would collapse of exhaustion after it. Um, he died then on January 10, 1917, uh, while he was visiting his sister in Denver. And of course, 1917 corresponds with 2017. It's the 100th anniversary. Uh, he died uh, 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 basically January 10, uh, 2017. We had a vigil up there, up uh, Buffalo Bill's grave, and uh, we've been paying tribute to him all year long. Even in death, though, he, he attracted crowds. 25,000 people came to see him lying in state in the Colorado Capitol. Uh, and you can see the streets of Denver lined as the, the, the caisson with his coffin proceeds through downtown Denver to the Capitol building. After a funeral uh, at the Elks Lodge, Buffalo Bill's body was then taken to Olinger's mortuary. And it was kept there until June 3rd. So think about this. Actually, the funeral was January 14 till June 3rd. Now they had embalming, and they probably re-embalmed him a couple of times to keep him relatively fresh. And so, um, see, now we can talk coroners again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's all, it's all, it's the big great mandala there. Um, 
so, uh, but he, he was kept there uh, for, for almost five months uh, till June 3rd and was buried on Lookout Mountain on June 3rd, 1917. Now, when he had died, his wife announced he'd asked to be buried on Lookout Mountain outside of Denver. This kind of shocked the folks in Cody, Wyoming, which he had helped found, as well as some of the folks in North Platte, Nebraska, where he had lived for many years. But all of his immediate family, and this is, you can tell this to all the folks you know from Wyoming, all of his immediate family, including his daughter, his foster son, Johnny Baker, and sisters, as well as his widow, Louisa, said he had asked to be buried on Lookout Mountain. He was baptized by a priest from Immaculate Conception Cathedral the day before he died. And that priest said he had said he wanted to be buried on Lookout Mountain as well. It's interesting. He'd been baptized as a baby, but I think he just wanted to make sure everything was set uh, when he died. So, and, and, so he said Lookout Mountain. In the months after, the members of the family chose a specific location. And then he was buried up there on June 3rd. 20,000 people came to that ceremony. So, so now, interestingly enough, or maybe not, um, the people in Wyoming didn't have much of a problem with him being buried there initially. But over time, uh, his niece, Mary Jester Allen, got into a spat with Louisa, his widow. And Mary Jester Allen had visited the grave and said, a better place could hardly be found. So that's what she said about this book. But after she got in this argument with Louisa over something, she decided that she would lead the campaign to return Buffalo Bill to his rightful place of burial, Cody, Wyoming. And that's pretty much, 1924 is the beginning of the controversy. That's about, what, seven years after he's buried there. That's the beginning of the controversy about Buffalo Bill being buried here and people in Wyoming saying he should have been buried there. And then after years of whining up there in, in Wyoming about this, they came up with a new story. And that is, oh, he's been buried here all along. We, he was stolen out of Olinger's mortuary. And they put a derelict, some old dead derelict in there. Maybe they went to the coroner's office. And they, they put somebody else in the coffin. And that's who's really buried on Lookout Mountain. Great story. Total BS. Why do we know it's total BS? Well, if, again, why were they whining all those years? But beyond that, look at this coffin. It's open. Louisa ordered the coffin opened just before he was put into the grave so all these folks, the well-wishers, the family, the friends could walk by and take one last look at Buffalo Bill. Don't you think somebody might have noticed? <laughs> so, anyhow. So, and if any of you are from Wyoming, I'd be happy to discuss this further. <laughs> So he is buried exactly where he wanted to be buried, um, on Lookout Mountain. Now, four years after the burial, uh, Cody's foster son and protege, Johnny Baker, who had been part of the show for 30 years, uh, he, he began the Buffalo Bill Memorial Museum in a rustic building, which still is there, uh, up near the grave. At the age of 14, he had begun performing with uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and uh, he was the same age that he joined that Buffalo Bill's son, Kit Carson Cody, named after the great scout, would have been had he not died of scarlet fever. So they became quite close. Uh, so Baker opened up this museum in 1921. Because of his close association with the Cody family and with Buffalo Bill, he was able to build up a large collection of memorabilia. That's right, I think I've mentioned that some of those photos, um, okay. I'll never get invited back with that kind of promotion. <laughs> anyway. Okay, and as I've already mentioned, 2017, the 100th anniversary of Buffalo Bill's burial on Lookout Mountain, where he wanted to be where he is. Um, uh, we've had a number of exhibits in the city of Denver. Most of them are actually down because they were temporary. We still have a special exhibit about the controversy over his burial up at the Buffalo Bill Museum and, and tells the history of the site since 1917. When Johnny Baker began our museum in 1921, he did it with the intent of memorializing his foster father, Buffalo Bill, showing his life, his contributions. That indeed happens on Lookout Mountain. Buffalo Bill's Wild West no longer entertains audiences, but every year 
Several hundred thousand people visit his grave from all over the world. Buffalo Bill's vision of the West has influenced literally millions of people and continues to live in the imagination of people everywhere. Thank you. Amen. Can I leave any time for Q&A? Oh, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now there is time for you to ask all those difficult questions that you're going to try and make me squirm with. We have, did I go too fast? No, no. Lots of time. Okay, good. Was he at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904? He was not. Okay. He did not see Judy Garland there either. No, anyway. <laughs> see, I'm, I'm dating myself. This is why I'm going to retire so we can all sit around and talk about old musicals and things. <laughs> uh, but no, he was not at that St. Louis World's Fair. Why? Did you have somebody there? Well, that's my hometown. That's yeah. your, what's that? It's our hometown. It's our hometown. Oh, okay. You grew up in St. Louis. His, His wife was from St. Louis. Okay. Louisa, yeah. Okay. Frederici. So she was from St. Louis. Okay. And the so he has connections. Son, what nationality and why did he, did he formally adopt him? Uh, he was never formally adopted. He was, he was, uh, he was Nebraskan, whatever nationality that is. <laughs> one, of, one of Buffalo Bill's posters has flags from all over the country being carried by his horse rider, the riders, and they're in the midst of his as a Nebraska flag. So it's like, okay, what country is that? Anyway, other questions? Colonel, how did he get that name? Now we can thank Nebraska for that. In 1887, before he went to Europe for the first time, uh, he, he was friends with the, um, the governor of Nebraska. You know that guy. Uh, the governor of Nebraska, uh, Thayer. Uh, governor Thayer of Nebraska, they were good friends. And so Thayer said, well, I'll tell you what, people will take you more seriously in Europe if you have some kind of a rank. So he appointed him a colonel in the Nebraska National Guard. And he kept that name from that point on. Interestingly enough, I mean, it wasn't just political because later on in 1890 during the ghost dance movement uh, and, and during that time in the aftermath of Wounded Knee, there were still concerns in Nebraska that, that uh, the Lakota would come down and there would be fights, you know, and there would be attacks, which involved a complete misunderstanding of the ghost dance. But at any rate, because of that, the governor Thayer, uh, still governor, uh, appointed Buffalo Bill to be, actually elevated him to general and asked him to be a liaison with the U.S. Army in the aftermath of the uh, Wounded Knee and the ghost dance movement. Uh, but he preferred colonel. So then he uh, just went back to being colonel afterwards. And then according to one of our visitors who saw the picture, shortly after that he founded Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> so one of our visitors was showing her son that and said, look at that man up there. He's the one that started Kentucky Fried Chicken. I hope she went to the museum and got the real story. <laughs> yes? How much would an old Buffalo Bill poster be worth? Well, we don't like to talk about value too okay. much, but um, they are quite valuable now, depending on the condition. Yeah, how I'll old, tell you that much. How old would the, oldest be? the earliest posters are obviously, actually, one of the pictures of the combination dated to the 1870s. Then the Wild West show itself, since it started in 1883, is when they began. And actually, since you bring up the posters, they were really some of the best posters made of the era, and they're extremely collectible because of that. Well, wagon driver is just, you know, he sits at the, uh, like a bull whacker. Yeah, you know what a bull whacker is. But anyway, uh, <laughs> a, a wagon, he was, essentially you saw the wagon. So he's going to be the one that's controlling the critters, the animals, the oxen. No, he would, he would sit on the, there'd be a, 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 a seat, wagon seat for him. Yeah, and he would drive the wagon. Yeah, now the other part was ghost dance, ghost dance. Now the ghost dance, uh, there was a guy in Nevada, a uh, name of, of uh, Wavoka, or that was his, his name. He was a Paiute Indian, and he had these visions. And the visions were, and this is kind of combined with Christianity as well, the visions were that he was Christ, or a new incarnation of, of the Messiah, of Christ. And he would be preaching to the Indians all over the America that if they practiced this ghost dance, and if they were peaceful, they were peaceful, 
they practiced the ghost dance and they were peaceful and faithful that eventually the white men would all leave and the buffalo would come back. So they, they did all of this and they, they, they hoped it would be that. Well, the problem is once you get a number of Indians together collaborating and dancing, a lot of the settlers, the people in the U.S. Army started to get really nervous and they decided they had to stop it. So they started rounding them up and in the case of Wounded Knee, they had a group of them and they were trying to disarm them. A gun went off by accident and uh, the, the, the uh, U.S. Uh, Army just started shooting people just shooting and shooting them. Hundreds of the warriors died and then the women and children who were in the village behind and they went and took refuge in this, this depression, hiding down there, but they had these big guns up on the hill, Hodgkiss guns, and they started even shelling the women and children. It was like just complete massacre carnage. They just, it was like they lost control and they just started shooting at everything and everyone, except for of course their own soldiers. Actually quite a few soldiers died of friendly fire as well. So that's Wounded Knee. If you're interested in anything more about Wounded Knee, the best book on Wounded Knee is called American Carnage by Jerry Green. It's got a lot of awards, if any of you want to go deep. It's a little thicker than mine. <laughs> but anyway, I think it probably weighs four pounds, too. Anyway, <laughs> other questions? Yes? What did you say he did during the Civil War? He, was, uh, he started out, actually, so he was very angry of course with the people in Missouri because they had really they stole his horse they they were trying to kill his father and so when he became older after his father's death after he'd been across the plains a couple of times he uh, joined the Jayhawks became a Jayhawker and the Jayhawkers were basically raiding Missourians Missourians were raiding the Kansans including Quantrill who burned down Lawrence which was a place of my birthplace so I don't have any problems with Missourians yeah right I was born in Lawrence uh, but at any rate so they, the, the Missouri and, and the Jayhawkers were just all fighting each other and um, his mother found out though that he was doing that and a lot of what was going on on both sides really was more about stealing horses and they were just kind of hooligans and when she found out Buffalo Bill had joined these Jayhawkers she said no you can't do that anymore that's you're just a bunch of horse thieves so he dropped out and two weeks later the group he had been with got ambushed by a bunch of Missourians on a raid and they were all killed so he was glad he listened to his mama <laughs> so uh, but at any rate then later on he joins the uh, what did I say, 7th Kansas Cavalry, once war breaks out. Yeah, well, that's his longest time connection right now. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, sorry. Boy, we've got a lot of graveyard humor going here. So, thank you. <laughs> um, he, he uh, actually, 1859, he came through with the gold rush. And that was pretty much his first exposure. At various points when he was working for the Army, he was empowered to come into Denver for various reasons. Um, he continued coming to Denver over the years. He had friends here. He had friends like he had a good friend in Fort Collins who basically provided him with the elk that he used in his Wild West in 1883 when he started. So he had a lot of connections. His sister moved here. Uh, I think he bought her a house and, and she knew, moved into northwest Denver or northern Denver, uh, Five Points area. And uh, so he had these kind of connections. When he died he had been actually visiting Glenwood Springs, taking in the waters and visiting a doctor who he wasn't feeling well. He said, you know, what can be done? And the doctor said, nothing. You're going to die real soon. Go take care of your affairs. And so he went to Denver and that's where he died at his sister's house. Yeah, yeah, call the coroner. Then the coroner got to go. Well, they, um, uh, you know, he had at one time said he wanted to be kept buried in Cody. And that was part of the controversy, but uh, he wrote a different will and he took that mention out of that and left it up to his wife. My wife will take care of it. And that's another long story about him and his wife almost getting divorced, reconciled, and then, uh, but when they were almost getting divorced, that's when he wrote the, the will that really doesn't talk about his wife at all, interestingly enough. And he's trying to divorce her and he says, I want to be buried in Cody on top of uh, Cedar Mountain. Well. 
1913, though, he writes a new will because they are reconciled and they become very close. We have another nice picture in this book here of <laughs> Buffalo Bill and the Weasa together, and it's a very affectionate picture. So they grew close, and so he left it up to her to act on his wishes in his second will, which is what she did. And so, what was that question again? I, <laughs> so so that's, that's the thing. He, he really, you know, had spent more time in Denver. He had reasons to feel more affiliation with Denver. And if you're a showman, do you want to be buried in a town of about 1,065 people or a town that's 250,000 people at the time and growing, major rail connections, a great view of the mountains and the plains. Everything kind of came together, I think, for him as a showman. So, but this is something we still debate. I have some people that don't agree with me in Cody, Wyoming on this. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, the first one, did he go any further from Europe? No, it was Europe. He got into Eastern Europe, but that was it. He, didn't get, he even, didn't even get into Scandinavia. Although, interestingly enough, there's been influence from Buffalo Bill's Wild West on all those countries, inclu including people in Scandinavia. Um, my wife's relatives in Norway all know Buffalo Bill. In fact, they probably know more about Buffalo Bill in Scandinavia than a lot of Americans do, even though he never went there. The Europeans are really into Buffalo Bill. Uh, and then how did he recruit these folks? That one's a pretty good question, but I think what happened was that people would find out that he was recruiting. And this was sort of the biggest show on earth, or one of the biggest ones. Some of them had been with circuses, and they basically left the circus to join Buffalo Bill's Wild West. A variety of, of sourcing, if you will, for the folks from all around the world. I haven't compared the wages. It was a good job. He paid his people well. He paid his Indians very well. So there's people out there. In fact, there was a young man two days ago that came to the museum and started arguing with our uh, young Indian man, I don't know what tribe, uh, who started arguing about how Buffalo Bill exploited the Indians and treated them like slaves. Total, totally wrong. That is bad information. He paid them as well as everybody else, and better in most cases than some of the other performers. And they jumped at the opportunity to leave conditions, as, which were pretty nasty, on Pine Ridge and join Buffalo Bill's Wild West. See the world, get paid, and continue to practice what they were not able to practice except illegally in secret back on the reservation. Why he used the Lakota primarily? He started out with Primary Lakota and Pawnee, and um, well, remember the picture, I'll go back, let's see if I can go back, this picture of, so you see Buffalo Bill in the center, here are the Pawnee here, they're Lakota. This is in 1886. Now, there's a good reason he's in the middle. <laughs> they were enemies. In fact, I don't think any of these are, but one of his performers who was Lakota was called Pawnee Killer. They, they really hated each other. So it was very difficult to keep order in that situation. But the other thing was the Lakota were kind of the rock stars, if you will, of the Plains Indians. They were the ones with the famous leaders like Sitting Bull and Red Cloud, uh, Crazy Horse. They were ones that held out longest against the U.S. military. And they were the ones that people wanted to see. That one's a little deeper than I may be able to answer, but I think it's simply the, the, the difference in the way they dealt with feathers. The full headdresses may have been more a Lakota thing than Pawnee. You'll notice, for example, the Pawnee are wearing breech cloths that are really almost aprons compared to something very short on the part, if you can see it at all, on the part of the Lakota. So I think that may be a sort of a cultural difference as well. That's a good question, and there's so much to tell that I sometimes forget about the family. Uh, he had, certainly Kit Carson was his young son who died of scarlet fever. He had Ora, Arta, and Irma, three daughters at various points. Ora died at 11 years of age. Arta died during the time that he was trying to divorce Louisa, and she accused him of breaking their daughter's heart. I think it was a little more complicated than that. But it was certainly something that, sh it was a terrible, the divorce thing was all over the newspapers. Buffalo Bill and wife divorce. And they're doing this in Cheyenne. And, and it's front page news. Buffalo Bill accuses wife of trying to poison him. Wife accuses Buffalo Bill of having an affair with Queen Victoria. It was silly. <laughs>
it took them a while to reconcile after those kind of accusations, but they did. So Arda died just before actually those nasty headlines started coming out. And then Irma was the youngest daughter. She died the year after Buffalo Bill. Both she and her husband died uh, of the influenza. And their descendants, though, are still in Cody, Wyoming. There's still some descendants there. And her great-great-granddaughter uh, teaches school in Arvada. They're, they're Buffalo Bills. So there are Cody family members around. And a few weeks ago, we hosted the International Cody Family Reunion in Golden and had a big barbecue, Buffalo barbecue for them up at Lookout Mountain. And several of the descendants were there. Very nice people. He, he, well, he didn't die a pauper like some people say, but a lot of his wealth was gone. He had spent, he gave a lot of it away. He also spent it on some business ventures that did not go well. He had mines in Arizona that didn't do well. And again, and this is where you're going to think I've got something against the people in Cody, but I have good friends up there. He lost a lot of money on some of his efforts in Cody, Wyoming. He was helping found a town. He pumped a lot of money into that. And now Cody is a thriving community. It's a wonderful place. If you've never been there, I strongly urge you to visit it on your way to Yellowstone. But, um, well, and visit it too, okay? It's just, it's, you know, that's when you travel. Anyway, but it's, you know, he, um, um, oh, now where was I? I was defending myself like I hate Cody. What's that? If he was bankrupt. If he was bankrupt. So he had lost a fair amount of money over those investments and things, but he was not a pauper. He, some people act like, oh, he was destitute. When he died, his properties and his cash flow or whatever was worth $90,000. $90,000 in 1917 is pretty good. If we could have that equivalent, I probably would be uh, driving a better car, you know, things like that. So. Okay, yeah. He, he spoke out on behalf of their rights. He didn't necessarily speak strong, strongly and say, oh, they're being mistreated or anything like that. He didn't get into that argument. But what he would do with them, uh, when they were in Washington, D.C., he would set up meetings uh, with uh, uh, political leaders. And in fact, since he knew several presidents, he set up meetings with Teddy Roosevelt, with William McKinley, and with, uh, with Grover Cleveland, and actually brought the Indians in to meet with those folks so they could speak on behalf of their people. Um, he, he didn't speak as strongly about Indians' rights as he did, let's say, women's rights. He was still, to some degree, a creature of his day. He was much more forward-thinking. And this is what I think we make a mistake in the 21st century of doing with people in the past. We tend to judge them based on our own ideas and the years that have gone since then. Base them on what they did at that time and what they were involved with at that time. And um, I, I, given, I, I hesitate to say that because of the controversy right now over the statues. The statues, the Confederate statues, those don't go, date back to the post-Civil War era. They were put up by a bunch of racists in the 1920s. And that's not, that's our time, okay? That's our time. I'm not going to judge Robert E. Lee, but I'm going to judge the people who are uh, saying that uh, Robert E. Lee was this person who did wonderful things and we should idolize him. He made his own mistakes and people are all going to judge us too and we hope they're as kind to us as we are hopefully to people in our past. So maybe that's a nice way to end. <laughs>